Do we want to go down in history as the people who did nothing to bring the world back from the brink? What good is all the extra wealth in the world gained from business as usual if you can do nothing with it except watch it burn in catastrophic conditions? Tim Cohen, author of The Antichrist and the Cup of Tea and uh, many other books forthcoming. Website, Prophecy House, P-R-O-P-H-E-C-Y-H-O-U-S-E dot com. The second edition of The Antichrist and the Cup of Tea is about to come out. The first edition I started in 1987 while I was still a cadet at the United States Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs. Uh, not long after God showed me uh, who the Antichrist is when I asked him to show me. So in other words, I started with hard evidence. I was not somebody who actually tried to figure out the identity of the Antichrist. Uh, instead, God gave me the hard evidence, uh, the main things, while I was still at the Academy. And so I began to research Prince Charles from the top down and uh, came across his official coat of arms, which is on the front cover of the Antichrist and the Cup of Tea as a heraldic achievement. Then also his name calculation in English and Hebrew using the original biblical numbering system showing that that works out to 666, the title Charles Prince of Wales in uh, both languages, which mathematically, statistically is basically impossible, but it's reality. So he's got the imagery, he's got the name calculation, as I discovered doing my research, many other things lined up with him to indicate that he is the Antichrist foretold in Scripture. Well, it's interesting. Uh, also, there's the um, the amazing figure of of uh, Prince Charles with these kind of angel like wings on his back, saying "Savior of the world," which is a bit of a giveaway, really, for someone who has got certainly got a, a kind of messiah complex of some kind. Uh, but you know, looking at the coat of arms, these coats of arms don't actually change a tremendous amount from generation to generation. So it could simply be that maybe the next generation, Prince William or another one. Uh, maybe will fit with the uh, heraldic achievement that you have worked out is talked about in Revelation. Actually, it's not possible. Uh, William and Harry have both already received their official coats of arms. They will not change uh, at any time in the future. Um, some unique things related to their father's coat of arms that are not true of William and Harry's or, for that matter, Queen Elizabeth II's are that on Prince Charles we find the Red Dragon, which uh, was adopted in 1958 as the national symbol of the nation of Wales, much like the United States, for example, has the eagle as its heraldic national symbol that we see on uh, one side of the U.S. coat of arms or heraldic achievement. The Wales adopted the Red Dragon in 1958 as the national symbol. Happens to be the same Red Dragon historically that traces to the standards of the Roman cohorts that occupied ancient Britannia and actually ancient Wales, uh, and that was I think, seen. I think, Tim, mm. for, for a lot of British people, they're pretty yeah. shocked to hear that the Red Dragon, which we, I mean, here in Bristol, we see it quite a lot. It's up on the bridge that goes over the River Severn as you cross it in the car, a great big Red Dragon. That That, that is something that doesn't predate 1958, and that is surprising to me. Do you Are you sure about that? Because I would have thought that the, the, the Red Dragon of Wales is something that was around for maybe even hundreds of years. Uh, actually, it was around for millennia. It's that that very samurai dragon was seen on the standards of the Roman cohorts that occupied ancient Britannia, and before that, the cohorts that occupied ancient Judea. And what that means is that the red dragon of Wales was actually seen in first century Judea on the flags, just as it is today in Wales. Uh, there have been different versions of it historically, but I actually give the documentation for that uh, in the second edition. Of the Antichrist and the Cup of Tea, I covered some documentation in the first edition. There's more in the upcoming second edition. But that being said, that particular red dragon in uh, Revelation 12 is literally identified as a symbol of Satan and as the serpent that deceived Eve in the Garden of Eden. And when Christians read an English translation of Genesis where it talks about that serpent and relates it to Satan, it's a unique word. So there are multiple words in Hebrew for uh, serpent or snake. And the particular one that's used there in uh, Genesis, as well as some other passages of the Torah, the first five books of Moses, can literally be translated as red dragon. And curiously, that is the way it's rendered, literally in Revelation chapter 12, a fiery red yeah. dragon. 
Well, that's, that is certainly very interesting. And we've just had this COP26 summit in Glasgow. Glasgow, by the way, for people that don't know, is a city which is an incredibly friendly place. I mean, it's uh, bizarre that uh, such a place with such poverty as there was, you know, big industries there. And even in those days, quite a lot of poverty amongst the industrial workers. And most of those industries, which centered originally around shipbuilding, a few other industries, but mainly shipbuilding, are pretty much closed down now. But still, the place has got an incredible flavor, Glasgow, of, of friendliness, people very open, hospitable, and that sort of thing. Uh, probably the mo- more so than any other city in the British Isles. I think, you know, it's, it's certainly my experience of Glasgow being like that. But there's been this uh, enormous summit of world leaders um, and amazing sort of uh, airport full of business jets of people who are basically saying no more business jets in fact no more aviation it seems that uh, much of the uh, thrust is towards using virtually zero fossil fuels which of course is going to hit the aviation industry and it would hit hit the car industry um the, you know uh, limiting diesels but at the same time as all this tim we've also had the introduction of a special tax in london to anybody driving diesel cars which is going to cost them something like £5,000 a year to drive in London. It's an extra tax, and it only hits the poorer people. Uh, if you've got a brand-new £50,000 Range Rover or 4x4 SUV uh, that's diesel, you don't pay a penny. So it's an amazing to see a Labour mayor, a left-wing mayor, supposedly uh, imposing a regressive tax in London. So lots of big changes going on in the UK, but also lots of words at, at the summit. And I know don't think it's just hot air either anyway what's your assessment of um because prince charles basically gave the keynote address at this international conference okay um let's give a slight amount of historical background to that and then i'll answer your question uh, more directly specifically on trying to get rid of fossil fuel based transportation so the context is that the british monarchy has been at the center of the modern environmental movement for more than a century Prince Philip was very heavily into it uh, prior to his death. You can literally trace the modern environmental movement to the British Flora and Fauna Protection Society in the past, which led to the uh, you know, World Wildlife Fund, International Union for the Conservation of Nature, uh, World Resources Institute, a variety of public-private partnerships around the environmental stuff. And then, of course, when Prince Charles had his investiture in July 1969 as Prince of Wales, which was the most widely viewed event in the history of the world at the time. And that, by the way, is the reason that the, the Red Dragon being adopted as a national symbol, symbol of Wales was so significant years prior to that. is because Prince Charles basically became the Prince of the Red Dragon, the Prince of Satan, quote unquote, literally. So that being said, Prince Charles took over. Uh, more or less center stage of the environmental movement from that point forward. It wasn't just Al Gore later on. And Al Gore credited Prince Charles personally for the success of the Rio Earth Summit in the early 1990s, uh, which, of course, led to what we now know as COP26. It led to COP21. Before that, led to COP16. Uh, earlier than that, you know, five years earlier, that was not particularly significant or successful in uh, Copenhagen. And so Al Gore, uh, because Prince Charles chaired meetings aboard the Royal Yacht Britannia, which he organized and he set up, Prince Charles did, uh, for the Rio Earth Summit. In other words, with the major stakeholders that led to the Rio Earth Summit. So Japan's premier was there. uh, Al Gore was there. uh, Brazil's president was there, et cetera, aboard the Britannia. Because Prince Charles did that and he basically made the Rio Earth Summit a success, Al Gore later credited him. For that, from that, years after the first edition of my book, The Antichrist and the Cup of Tea, was published, which was in 1998, years later, the statue that you mentioned was commissioned to Prince Charles, which has the phrase Savior of the World on it. It depicts the prince as a winged god, quote unquote, you know, so an angelic figure dressed only in a loincloth, but it has Prince Charles' head standing atop a mass of human bodies with the inscription on the base of it. Savior of the world. So the world has seen the miniature version of that because the BBC photographed it in the early 2000s. Uh, Brazil's uh, a Brazilian state government on the outskirts of a rainforest commissioned it basically to help Prince Charles as the environmental savior of the world. 
So the Rio Earth Summit, in turn, and, and I, let me just mention, there's a full-size version of that statue nobody's ever seen that happens to be the same size, the same height as the cherubim, the two angelic statues that went around the Ark of the Covenant in ancient Israel's Holy of Holies. So in other words, the statue that is to be the abomination that causes desolation erected on a, you know, in a newly constructed holy place in some years from now in Israel, that statue already exists. It's in a crate somewhere. Nobody's seen it. It's ready to go, and it's got Prince Charles' face on it. Now, that being said, uh, the Rio Earth Summit led to the Kyoto Protocol, uh, you know, which the United States basically didn't sign on to. The Kyoto Protocol, in turn, and that was in Japan, the Kyoto Protocol, in turn, led to COP 16, which was not viewed as a success. COP 16 led to COP 21 five years ago, uh, which had the largest gathering of global leadership in the entire history of the world in one place at one time ever. 190 plus world leaders, more than 150 actual heads of state. Obama was there. Prince Charles was there. It was hosted in France, Paris, France. France, France's president was there. So everyone would have thought, you know, rationally that it would have been uh, perhaps France's president who would have opened it and delivered the first speech. France's president who would have been at the photograph, you know, at the center of the group photograph. Or if not him, then maybe somebody like Obama at the time. But instead, to the surprise of the world, it was Prince Charles who opened it who gave the first speech and who was at the very center of the photograph of all those global leaders. Why? That was never explained to the public. And then we get to COP26 this year, and we've got Prince Charles center stage again. Why? So you see, all these years, Prince Charles has been moving behind the scenes and everybody thinks he's a powerless uh, clown. And, you know, he talks to plants and that he's got very little substance between the ears, uh, you know, that he's got no power. But this is what the mass media, you know, under Satan wants the public to think of the Antichrist, not pay attention until it's too late. But what's happened this year is we see that Prince Charles is now calling for a war economically, you know, in essence, on the world to enable and facilitate uh their green agenda, so to speak. And part of that is getting rid of fossil fuels and basically changing transportation globally. Of course, the people who have gone to COP26, you had over 400 jet aircraft, right? From private, from participants, you know, flying 400 jet aircraft for that event. A lot of people have made a fuss over that on the internet, showing the hypocrisy. Surely talking about a war on climate is almost like talking about a war on China, because we know of all the nations in the world, the country that has the biggest problem with at atmospheric pollution, in fact, many of their cities, you've even got people having to wander around in places like Beijing with oxygen masks on because otherwise they can't breathe because of the terrible air quality. H having a war on pollution is rather like having a war on China, it seems. Well, yes, and it's really the war in this case is really on the modern capitalist economic system. And Prince Charles actually made that clear uh, within the last oh, 13 years or so. And uh, what he's talking about basically is subverting the modern international banking system and putting, I think, the figure that's been bandied about uh, this time. Last time it was 90 trillion. This time I think the figure is 130 trillion dollars with a T, you know. At the disposal of this group, this major group of modern international banksters, putting that money essentially at the disposal of a budding uh, global government. And their intention, Tony, is far more uh, evil than the public has heard. And they've got a plan that the public hasn't heard to enable all of this and the COVID-19 virus and and uh, jabs, which many people refer to as bioweapons, and I agree that's what they are for depopulation. But those jabs, that whole agenda that's been facilitated in terms of the tyranny and the budding totalitarianism through the excuse of COVID-19. 
That whole thing. Yeah, is but hang on, hang on. You know, you're you're talking about this as a as a war against the public through vaccines. The Prince Charles is not talking about that at all. Let me just quote from him. He says, "I can only urge you, as the world's decision makers, to find practical ways of overcoming differences, so we can all get down to work together to rescue this precious planet and save the threatened future of our young people." Now. That is echoes very strongly, I think, if if people are allowed to read or hear that in China, as they see their cities being basically dissolved in a toxic sw- uh, swamp of pollution, they're thinking similar thoughts. They're saying, well, look, actually, the system that we've got around us uh, is killing us, you know, and it can't go on. Something's got to be done to stop it. And of course, we've got a big tradition, probably for the last uh, you know, century or so from the time of the Bolsheviks, etc., of saying, well, actually, capitalism has got to go because it's more destructive than uh, than uh, helping uh, the general population. So Schwab and Prince Charles, through their great reset effort with the World Economic Forum preceding COP21 in the last couple of years, have come out very strongly, including through advertisements and books. Uh, basically stating, and they've stated this publicly, that in advertisements, video advertisements, that by 2030, people won't own anything and they'll be happy. Now, we look at some statement like that and we think that's ludicrous. I happen to be aware, however, that they've got an actual plan in place to make that happen in reality. It's not a joke. Well, look, before, we, hang on, before we hear about your um, plan that you seem to have dug out, why don't you address my question, which is really about so, this whole yes. idea of trying to yes. save the planet. Now, this, this idea of trying to save the planet from pollution, recognizing that capitalism has got some really fundamental flaws which, which spread injustice around the world. I mean, that echoes true to millions and millions, probably billions around the planet, particularly, as I said, the pollution message in China. All right. So let's talk about how they make that happen. There, there are multiple ways. One is to actually collapse the economic system so transportation becomes more difficult. Another is to make it so that Fossil fuels become so pricey, nobody can afford them. And a third way is to try to force everybody out of their uh, gas and diesel fuel vehicles, et cetera, uh, toward electric transportation. The dirty little secret, and I'll call it that, that the public's not really hearing is that there are no electric grids on planet Earth capable of supporting the number of electrical vehicles, whether it be just plain old cars, automobiles, let alone aircraft, uh, trains, etc., to support the number that would be necessary to even begin to replace uh, the fossil fuel-based transportation that we have around the world today. We don't even have close to half the electric grid capacity in the United States, let alone the rest of the world, to enable something like that. It's literally not possible without building a huge number around the world Including in the United Well, that's States. what they're planning to do, Tim, isn't it? And they're also saying that uh, you know we've got until twenty. They're, they're not. They're being. They're trying to be as realistic as possible. They're saying we've got until twenty fifty to do this. Well, yeah. If you believe them, twenty thirty is the real target, though, for the WEF. And if they participate in a mixture of collapsing those transportation capabilities while depopulating the world simultaneously. They might just achieve their goal, and they're willing to sacrifice the human race, Tony, in order to achieve their goal. Well, yeah, that's easy for you to say that, but I still would like you to address this um, question of, uh, you know, the the, the appeal to the public is – is one that is likely to be very well received. Most people are aware that there's a problem and a flaw with the economic system, with the capitalist system. And they're also very much aware that there is, and I would say this is probably much, much truer in China than anywhere else, that there are serious problems with pollution that, you know, make the air unbreathable. Something needs to be done about this. And, um, you know, so what would you do? Well, of course, you know, China and India are not on board. China and Russia didn't even attend COP26 in person. They're not on board, China and India, with the goals of COP26. For them to be on board with those, they'd have to be willing to basically eliminate their coal power production, which they're not going to do. They're still ramping that up to an extent 
in China. India, same thing, but especially China. China is the worst polluter on the planet in terms of coal power. You know, if you don't get China in line, uh, or for that matter, India either, but especially China, forget all the goals. The real thing that they're doing is not trying to fix the climate. They're trying to enable taxation by stealth using the excuse of eco-fascist pollution to enable global governance. That's the real goal. Okay, well, it's, I mean, it's almost, I, I feel, I hope you don't mind me saying you, you still haven't really answered my question, which is about the, um, particularly about the um, economic system. People around the world well, recognize right. that, it, that this is flawed and that someone needs to deal with it. At least Prince Charles, I mean, you may not like him and you may think he has other agendas. At least he's stood out there on the world stage saying the obvious, which everybody knows, is that the economic system is failing and we need to replace it. No, I don't think it is failing. I think they're intentionally collapsing it. There's a big difference. What they're doing, uh, for example, in the United States, take our country as an example. You've got the Biden folks who are enabling the Russian pipeline to Europe for natural gas, et cetera. You've got them shutting down a pipeline that involved Canada and the U.S. that was just getting underway with Trump uh, prior to Biden coming into office, shutting that down basically doubling our energy costs in a period of oh, 10 months here in the United States and uh, now talking about potentially shutting down or not allowing maintenance to repair or replace another pipeline in the U.S. while also cutting back on the ability to do additional exploration you know, on federal and other lands in the United States to exploit other natural uh, gas type resources and oil resources, and then at the same time trying to lock down our economy further by basically kicking a significant percentage of people out of work through forced so-called vaccine mandates, in other words, to collapse our economy, and then making it so that our transportation system for transporting goods from ports in the United States, through which much of our goods come, more than a third of our goods, you know, come from China, et cetera, through ports, particularly in California, basically clogging that whole thing up intentionally so that a lot of truckers can no longer drive their trucks because they don't meet the new pollution standards within the past 11 years that just were enforced, began to be enforced um, this year in California, et cetera. A whole bunch of things at once, and that just scratches the surface. To collapse our economy, make things very pricey, throw a lot of people out of work, and then blame it on the environment. And other excuses like that, you know, on the need to cut back on carbon pollution, yada, yada. And frankly, something similar is transpiring in other places around the world. It's not that the capitalist okay, so system what, what is failing. We, uh, what They're should collapsing. we be looking at? So what should we be looking at potentially Prince Charles being up to next? It's not just Prince Charles. They're going to move for a while through the World Economic Forum, particularly, you know, and when we look at these vaccine mandates and these other things that are happening with, I'll just call them the jabs around the world under the, under the uh, World Health Organization. And then in addition to that here in the U.S., the Centers for Disease Control and then the National Institute of Health and uh, NAID, et cetera. When we look at those things, all that is being pushed from the top. And the WHO uh, is tied in with Big Pharma, which is actually tied in with, as it turns out, the British monarchy historically and particularly Prince Philip before he passed. It's now under Prince Charles. But all of that stuff, you know, the public, Tony, doesn't get to see these agreements, for example, with Pfizer or Moderna that nations are making. Those agreements are set up so that, quite literally, if the, the big pharma companies don't provide those shots uh, to countries and the countries can't pay for them, the big pharma companies can take the national assets, military and industrial, both, from those countries. That's what's in their actual agreements that they're not sharing with the public. So they have a plan to get the public hooked on these so-called vaccines, then to use those to extort assets from national governments. They have a different plan for the individual person, meaning like you and me. And you can see some of that playing out in Australia, kind of as a canary, a canary in a coal mine, as it were. But the bottom line is what they're going to do for the next, I don't know, maybe two years, we'll see is work on collapsing the system as far as they can. 
So well, anyway, you're making some pretty strong accusations there about these uh, secret agreements. How do you know what's in those agreements? Have you got any evidence for this? As a matter of fact, Sky News in Australia has been putting out evidence on it. They've actually gotten a hold of some of the agreements. And I can share some of the links with you, but they've shown them on the air. And so, yes, the documentation has come out recently where they've actually gotten a hold of the agreements themselves. It's quite shocking. It's beyond the pale. It's something nobody could believe without actually seeing the agreements. But they're okay, I mean, these sound to me a little bit like the agreements which were being uh, promulgated in in uh, Greece and places like that under the Brussels European Union, where what would happen if, say, the Greek government went bankrupt is that it was called a, it's a, a, a program called nation state bankruptcy, where you would get uh, you would get to national assets such as. Uh, the criminal justice system, law enforcement, police stations, uh, whole entire police forces handed over to the private banks who had land, lent the money to Greece uh, if they couldn't pay those loans. So it's not beyond the realms of possibility. So what would happen if Australia ran out of money right now? Well, what they're OK, so we know and I'm sure you're aware of this, that these uh, DNA and mRNA gene therapeutics that they're calling vaccines for COVID-19, which would be AstraZeneca's, Pfizer's, uh, Johnson & Johnson's, Moderna's, and then also the Sputnik vaccine from Russia and another one from China. China has a real vaccine called CoronaVac, but they've also got a DNA-based one that's more like Sputnik and Johnson & Johnson. I'm referring to the mRNA and DNA gene therapeutics, not real vaccines, in other words. They know, and you know at this point, that every few months now, the efficacy of those against COVID-19 is waning. And in the process, people's immune systems are being damaged. And so they're pushing now these booster shots. And they're claiming that we might need a booster every six months or whatever for those who receive the jabs. What they're not admitting is that apart from causing all sorts of biological damage to the endothelial lining of the cardiovascular system that the immune systems likewise of these individuals are being damaged and is cumulative with each jab. So we could, and this is very hypothetical, it's very conspiracy, uh, conspiracy theory type stuff at the moment, but we could see a situation where people are hooked on these jabs to live. And in that situation, if these companies, which have these secret agreements with governments, say pay up so you know, pay up this amount, in order to have the jab, and by the way, under our agreements, you can't produce those yourself. You also can't get them from some other country. You have to get them from us. Pay up, or if you can't pay up, turn over these assets. Well, the assets that are compassed in those agreements are not just police forces. They're militaries, government facilities, the entire industrial base of the countries, literally every asset those countries have, more or less except for the private assets of the individuals. And for them, they've got a different plan. So here's where I'm going with that. We could see a situation in the future where they use these so-called vaccines to extort the assets of governments that aren't playing well with their plan for global governance. That's on the table. And um, so I expect to see between now and the next, you know, climate agreement, COP31 or whatever it is, if it happens, them to proceed along the lines of some plan like that. And I hope I'm wrong about the so-called vaccines, but all the evidence I have says I'm right. And I've got a lot of evidence coming out in a separate book from the Antichrist and the tea, So I'm not just saying this stuff, it's documented. <laughs> yeah, uh, including the agreements. It's not a joke. It's crazy, but it's not a joke. Yeah, and well, it's not it's not crazy, is it? Because this is what they said about Adolf Hitler. Oh, this crazy guy. You know, he wasn't crazy. He was uh, very, very focused and he considered that he had the correct way of doing things. And so he basically forced everybody to fit in with his way, you know, his mindset. But this isn't necessarily crazy because it it focuses more and more power into the hands of fewer and fewer people. Now, 
and you know obviously it's not it's it, it, it's psychopathic or sociopathic but those for those individuals what it's doing is it's kind of justifying their existence and it's forcing more power into their hands but look, let's get back to cause what i want to ask you about prince charles is what do you which direction do you expect him to take do you think he's going to be uh be being seen more on the world stage in the future what, what do you think we should be looking for all right well first we're going to see wars with north korea and iran I have written about that in my book called North Korea, Iran, and the Coming World War. I expect to see those commence within the second year of the final seven years preceding Armageddon. After those wars kick off, uh, at the midpoint of that seven-year period, we'll see the Great Tribulation start. A number of things happen with the Antichrist in conjunction, meaning at the same time uh, as the Great Tribulation starts in conjunction with it. Among those are uh, a mortal wound that's received by one of the heads, plural, of that quote-unquote first beast of Revelation 13. Now, that first beast is the actual coat of arms of Prince Charles. And on his coat of arms are a number of beasts that form a corporate, united coat of arms. Those beasts represent a group of nations, in this case, the heart of the United Kingdom. So Wales, the Red Dragon, the a red lion for Scotland, a harp for Ireland, a lion leopard bear in the case of Prince Charles coat of arms instead of a normal lion or lion leopard for England. And then there and then there are 10 lion leopard bears in the center of that coat of arms representing the offspring, if you will, historically of the United Kingdom. So New Zealand, Australia, Canada, the United States, uh, for example. At any rate, one of those heads, and I'm presuming it's the Antichrist, which is how Christians have traditionally read the passage when it says that this first beast, one of his heads, plural, will receive a mortal wound. So presumably that will be Prince Charles, but this beast will receive a mortal wound that's viewed as fatal by the world and recover from it in a way that the world begins to follow after the beast or worship the beast, or in this case, the Antichrist. Now, just as Judas is carry out, was possessed by the devil before he betrayed Christ at the midpoint of the crucifixion week for his crucifixion, you know, Judas being the son of perdition, the only other son of perdition in the Bible, which happens to be the Antichrist, will receive this mortal wound, recover from it, and then be possessed by the devil, meaning his personality will change. He'll be possessed by the devil and the world will begin to follow after him. That happens. At the midpoint of the last seven years preceding Armageddon, we could right now, uh, as we're speaking, be less than three years away from that, or we could be five or six or seven years away from that. We'll have to wait and see, you know, based on how soon those wars with North Korea and Iran and so forth happen. But with Prince Charles, until we get to the point that that great tribulation actually commences, meaning the point where the wound has occurred, the recovery has occurred that so startles the world that human beings in mass begin to follow after this antichrist and worship him. And then the mark of the beast, et cetera, gets implemented also after that. Till we get to all of those things, I expect to see him mostly remain behind the scenes as he has. And what he's doing right now through the World Economic Forum, through the global green movement, if you want to call that, the latest iteration being COP26, is he's consolidating power with the international elite, with the banksters, uh, with Big Pharma, actually. You know, I told you this agenda was originally under Prince Philip. It goes back decades and decades. It's not a new thing. What's happened with COP26, or excuse me, with COVID-19 in the last two years was pre-planned. And it was pre-planned not, a, you know, not in the last five or six years, but literally for decades. But at any rate, that being said, we're going to see these things continue to consolidate to the point where they try to bring in the equivalent of these so-called vaccine passports. And what, to my knowledge, nobody else has produced evidence for, but some people have talked about. Actually, quite a few people are talking about it at this point is the idea that these so-called passports could be a precursor to the mark of the beast. We're seeing in places like Australia, some other places around the world, uh, where people can't go into stores in some areas to buy or sell without the passport showing that they've been vaccinated, uh, can't you know, go into restaurants or gyms or you know, public transportation, they can't take it. All kinds of things that are, that are being imposed in terms of restrictions 
around having that ID showing this so-called vaccination. Well, on those passports, there is a QR code, which is a, a quick read uh, barcode of types. It's a little bit different, a little bit different from the traditional uh, uh, European article numbering or UPC United product code uh, barcode that we see on goods that are bought and sold around the world. Well, the UPC code and the EAN code, as I pointed out in the first edition, the Antichrist and the Cup of Tea, all of them have three sixes. It's actually the security bar pattern or the guard bar pattern of the code itself. So three sixes are literally on every item sold on the planet that's being bought and sold uh, in stores, et cetera, that have uh, a UPC or EAN barcode on them. But the vaccine passports have a different kind of barcode, most of them, which is the QR code. And as it turns out, the QR code, which is used for identification and tracking human beings uh, in a lot of ways, and then now for buying and selling associated with these so-called vaccine passports, also has three sixes. There's a mass, There's a set of uh, at least eight or nine masking patterns applied to that code each time that it's scanned to identify its orientation and be able to read it. And part of that process is identifying those three squares, three sets of nested squares that they show, black and white squares on the corners of each of those codes. And as it turns out, each of those three squares has two threes in each one, totaling for six. So three plus three, three plus three, three plus three, or six, six, six. And the public doesn't know that. I've got the technical mm-hmm. documentation to show that. That's in the second edition of the Antichrist and the Cup of Tea and the material on the barcodes. But the point is, it is factually and provably a precursor to the mark of the beast. They're not yet sticking it on people's right hands or foreheads. So um, Daniel 9.27 talks about a coming peace treaty. It's typically viewed that way, that a prince of Roman lineage who will, you know, I'd presumably be the Antichrist, that's a typical interpretation, will be involved in imposing or enforcing in relationship to Israel. Yeah, so okay. the I don't want you to brought, go into it too much. Just give us the yep. actual verses so people can okay. make up their own minds. Yep, Daniel 9.27. I document in the book that that whole thing sits beneath Prince Charles, the whole false peace process for decades. Then Revelation chapter 13, which talks about a beast with feet like a bear, body like a leopard, mouth like a lion, to whom a dragon, and in Revelation 12, that's the fiery red dragon or Satan, gives his power throne and great authority. That was fulfilled in July 1969 with Prince Charles at his investiture, and that was the first time in history the world actually saw his official coat of arms that is on the cover of the Antichrist and the Cup of Tea. And all oh, that's that your book. Tree. Yeah, I think you've done very well. You've plugged it several times, but just give us those two Bible verses again, please. Okay, Daniel 9:27, Revelation 13. I'd also mention uh, a portion of Daniel chapter. Seven, which talks about the little horn of the eyes of man or a unicorn of human, with uh, human eyes. That's also on Prince Charles' coat of arms. And then finally, the name calculation, verse 18 of Revelation chapter 13. So again, Revelation 13. And uh, of course, in the Antichrist and the Cup of Tea, we show that it's Prince Charles' name. His title by which he's globally known, Charles Prince of Wales. I mean, it's a bit of a riddle in the Bible, though. It's quite a, you know, it's it's not normal for the Bible to do these sorts of riddles that people have got, or a quiz, if you want, you know, maybe a bit a bit different to the sort of quiz that people get in the center pages of one of their daily newspapers, like Sudoku or something. But it's certainly a quiz that's in there. Uh, And finally, Tim, where do people get hold of your Antichrist and a Cup of Tea book? Prophecy House is the publisher, so it's spelled just like it sounds, P-R-O-P-H-E-C-Y, Charlie Y, so P-R-O-P-H-E-C-Y, the word house, H-O-U-S-E, dot com. Okay, Tim Cohen, thanks very much for joining us. Thank you, Tony, pleasure. Now-